Daniel chapter 12. Today's our last message, our 40th message in the book of Daniel. So it's kind of like saying goodbye to a good friend. We've got to know Daniel a little bit. As we begin, let's turn, please, to Daniel chapter 12. I'll read verse 9 as we begin the message. And he said, and who said that? Who was talking to Daniel in these last verses from verse 9 through 13? Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And let's pray. Father, how we thank you now for this opportunity to be together with your precious people, with your precious, powerful word of God. By your Holy Spirit, teach us. Oh, Spirit of God, come down. We even ask you to bring conviction of sin upon our city today and even smite those who are engaged in evil today that they would recognize that sin will not satisfy the pleasures of sin or only for a season and that will bring a great judgment. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive our land. And as you even said, if your people, which are called by, by your name, would humble themselves and pray. Lord, we've been through pandemic, but we still not listened. So, Father, forgive us. Turn us to you now today. Help us to hear your word so that we would live for you in these last days, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message today is how to live with the last days in sight. You need to just think about the perspective of life in these past few years we've been living. Life is moving so fast, sometimes it's hard to keep up with the pace. Don't you agree? But these are perilous times. These are the last times. A lot of chaos. And just think, we've gone through back from 9-11, which will be the 20th anniversary this September. And we've gone through the terrorist attack where Islamic terrorism was seemingly the number one threat that we were all focused upon. And then all of a sudden, boom, we got hit with something we never could have imagined. The world shuts down, right, with this whole pandemic. And now we're, we're kind of rising up out of, of the pandemic, but we're sitting, uh, we're sitting waiting to see what's going to happen next. Because we're hearing things like unprecedented debt, the government literally giving away trillions and trillions of dollars so people don't have to work. Cyber attacks upon our oil and energy, and maybe who knows where else these cyber attacks could hit. Maybe our electrical grids or whatever, we're not sure what could happen. And then along with all this, there's this inflation rising. I saw that in May it was the highest inflation since like the month of May, highest inflation since 1992. And then we hear these rumblings and some are saying it's really just a matter of time until the United States dollar ceases being the global reserve currency. And when that, if, if that happens, it will shake the global economic system. And it's gonna actually happen because during the Antichrist kingdom, the American dollar is not the global <laughs> reserve currency. The Antichrist is gonna have power over the global currency with the mark of the beast. So we're really heading toward these times quickly. And the ultimate answer though to these problems is not to be discouraged, not to be defeated, not to be down and, and say, well, woe is me, but it's to look to Jesus Christ because any problems this world has, whether it's terrorism or pandemics or the global currency or the inflation or whatever, Jesus Christ is the one we need. And Jesus Christ is the one who has the last word in Daniel. Now, I ask you this question. Who is speaking these words to Daniel at the end of the book of Daniel? How many of you have, like, one of those Bibles where the words of Jesus are in red? How many of you have a Bible? These words are in red, aren't they? No, they're not. Are they really in red? 
In Daniel chapter 9 or Daniel chapter 12 verse 9. No, I'm just kind of like teasing you. No, they're not a red, but Jesus speaks them. I believe that. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, let's look at the text. Let's begin at verse 5, and I'm just going to say a few general things as we go down into the message today. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and then the other on that side of the bank of the river. So what are those other two? Not men, angels. He says, other two, two other angels. How come? Because beginning in chapter 10, Daniel sees a vision of Jesus Christ. And we're going to go back there in just a moment. And then he meets an angel who had been wrestling and then had been delivered by Michael the archangel so he could come to Daniel. And that angel then tells Daniel all the prophecies he's just heard throughout Daniel chapter 11. It was an angel speaking to Daniel. So from Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, it's one prophetic unit. It's a section all together. Now, let me continue reading here. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 6. And one said to the man, clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So one of the two angels that Daniel sees says to this man, clothed in white linen, how long will that time of great trouble be? Now, who is that man in white linen? Back in Daniel chapter 10, we did a whole message on that. Go, now, go back to Daniel chapter 10. And I want to see the connection here. If you look at verse 4 of Daniel chapter 10, he says, In the 4 and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is the Tigris, which is Hittichel. That's what it says in the text, but it's the Tigris River. So, again, that's in Daniel chapter 10. And notice the connection in verse 5 of Daniel 12. He's by the bank of the river. So, it's the same time period. And then we see in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5, he says, Then I lifted up my eyes. Daniel lifts up his eyes, looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in what? Linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. Verse 6, can you read that verse with me? His body also was like the burl, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And we said, and that is who? Jesus. This is exactly as John the Apostle described Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. And he's clothed in fine linen. And now we come to chapter 12, and this one is the one speaking to Daniel, Jesus Christ. In Daniel chapter 12, and one said to the man clothed in linen. You see, that's the man we just read about back in chapter 10. And the angel says, how long shall it be to the end? How long will it be for this great tribulation time? And Jesus answers the angel in verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. And I know, Mike, that reminds us of what chapter in the book of Daniel? 10, doesn't it? Yeah, it reminds us of what you said that was Jesus. And I said it wasn't, but maybe you're right <laughs> based on that, right? <laughs> and you're like... But that reminds us of, of the, the great angel in Daniel chapter 10 who, who, who swore by, by the, with his right hand as well. But he, then he says, and it shall be for a time, times, and a half. In other words, the great tribulation will last for how long? Three and a half years. So Jesus is answering how long the great tribulation will, will last. When it shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, oh, my Lord. Now Daniel's talking to Jesus. What shall be the end of these things? So that's a different question. Daniel is saying, what's going to be the outcome? What's the closing stages? What will the end be like? So think of this. Daniel, after receiving all these visions from God throughout the book of Daniel, the visions of the, the great image with the heads of gold and the, the, all the other images of the, the animals and the lepers and the bears, you know, and telling of the kingdoms to come of Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and the kingdom of the Antichrist. Daniel's received all these visions. He still has questions. 
<laughs> when it comes to prophecy, it seems like our questions never get fully answered, right? What shall, how, I think Daniel's kind of asking this though. How do I navigate life now that I know this? How do, how do I live now that I know this? So I put it to you. We've been, I've been, I put it to myself. Been studying and reading in the book of Daniel. 40 sermons. So what? <laughs> now what? How should this affect us? And so there's three things that I want us to see. As Jesus Christ has the last word in the, in the book of Daniel. And you could put in the margin of your Bible in Daniel chapter 12, especially from verse 9 through 13. You can put record notes and say these words should be in red. <laughs> Okay, and Jesus is speaking, the same Jesus who we saw in Daniel chapter 10. And the Lord Jesus gives Daniel three practical ways to live with the last days in sight. How to live through days of deception and debauchery. How to live through days of terror and treachery. How to trust the Lord. And first of all, so we want to see, how do we live? Press on how? Confidently. Be confident. Our God rules in the kingdom of men. There might be wicked rulers, but God rules, rules over all. Satan is the God of this world, but our God is the God of heaven and earth. So press on confidently. That's in verse 9. The Lord Jesus tells Daniel, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. That means the Lord Jesus is telling Daniel, the word that I have given to you, and it could mean in this context, the whole book itself, the book of Daniel is closed up and sealed. In other, and we looked at this last week. We said that means that it's been that this inspired word is going to be preserved. It's not going to be changed. Man's not going to mess with it or tamper with it. So we can be confident that we have the unchanging, infallible, inerrant, and inerrant means without any errors. And it's inspired, and that means God has what? He has breathed it out, the divine breath of God. So we can be confident, those getting baptized yesterday, we can be confident, those who have been baptized following Jesus, be confident. We have the unshaken, unchanging word of God. Be confident in the word of God. Never doubt the Bible in these days. We don't have to run to and fro to psychics, false prophets. We don't have to seek after signs and wonders. We're seeking Jesus Christ through his word and his Holy Spirit will teach us. I say to you, be confident. God is at work. I told you the story about May and her salvation, how she thought she was going to die. So she asked Yen to come and help her write a will. And she ended up getting saved and then baptized with her children. Isn't that amazing? And then our dear brother, Michael Coleman, who's with us here, what a testimony he has. You should talk to Michael and just let him share his life, how he was basically raised by bikers, you know, and, and lived in the basement of his grandmother's house. And his uncle was a United States Senator at one time, Minnesota. He was beat by that con man and Al Franken. Thank you. <laughs> he was, that's who he was beat by. But praise God, the Lord saved brother Michael. And now Michael says, I can't believe it took me so long to come to Jesus. He saved my life. Hallelujah. Michael, be confident. Press on in the word of God. The, the word of God will never change in these fast changing times. People have been after me to watch this. This uh, It's a crowdfunded um, show about Jesus called The Chosen. How many of you heard of The Chosen? Have you heard of it? You can download the app. And I'm not into Jesus movies, okay, just as a disclaimer. I don't like Jesus movies generally, but people kept saying, oh, you got to watch this. You got to watch. So far, I was like, okay. And I, I started watching it. You know what? 
they do a really good job staying faithful to the text of the scripture, but yet weaving in interesting things that could have happened, knowing what Peter was like, or Matthew, what he was like, and Nicodemus, and so forth. But this is Matthew in the Chosen movie, and he's having a conversation with Philip, and Philip says to him, to Matthew, what you think you know, it doesn't matter. And then Philip went on to say, only that Jesus chose you. And then, he, and then Philip says, that's where your confidence comes from now. I like that. Our confidence must come from Jesus Christ. His cho choosing of us, as he said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. That's what matters. Be confident in the word of God. Be confident in your calling to Jesus Christ. And I say, press on confident, knowing that trials that you face, it's not because God doesn't love you. It's he's seeking to purify you. God puts trials in our life. And, and I want you to see carefully what Daniel says here in verse 10, um, where the Lord tells Daniel and what Daniel writes. So the Lord tells Daniel, go your way. The words are sealed up till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. And he's talking about the times of trouble that are going to come. Times of trouble. He's going to, this world, you know what trouble this world is going to face in the future? Trouble it has never seen to this day. Now think about that. Has this world had trouble in it? All kinds of wars, famine, pestilence, plagues have come upon this world throughout history. But whatever has happened up to this point, according to my Bible, according to what Jesus said, according to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, there's coming a time of trouble that never was since there was even a nation. And this time of trouble, he said, will purify the true people of God. It will make them white and it will try them. And that's what trouble does to the people of God. Those three words, by the way, used in this speaking specifically of the time of tribulation are the same words that the angel had told Daniel about during the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, when God raised up the Maccabees. If you go back to Daniel chapter 11, and if you just notice in verse 35 of Daniel chapter 11, there is written, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white. So the same words, to try them, to purge them, make them white. What, is what do trials do in our life? They try us. God allows trials to purify us, to purge us, to make us more like Christ. Now, there is coming a time of great tribulation. That's the three and a half years especially. I don't believe the church is going to go through that. But that doesn't mean the church doesn't go through tribulation. All God's people go through tribulation. Jesus promised tribulation. Paul said we'll have tribulation. Peter wrote about it when he says, wherein you greatly rejoice that though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trying of your faith is much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, trials, God is going to allow trials. He loves you. And he wants to purify us and make us more like Jesus. So press on confidently. Confident that trials will purify us, the people of God. Do you know how much trial the early church had? Its first 300 years or so, there was off and on intense persecutions. And one of the most wicked Roman Caesars during the first 300 years of the church, he lived during the days of the apostle Paul and Peter himself, themselves. Now think of that. Who puts rulers in charge at such and such a time? God. That's what the book of Daniel is about, right? The theme we have said of the book of Daniel over and over in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, where it says that, that you may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. Do you know who the most high put in charge when Peter was serving and ministering and trying to reach the world 
as an apostle. He put a man named Nero. Nero was one of the most debauched, depraved, sadistic rulers in all of human history. Yet God allowed him to reign during the ministry of the apostles to purify the church and to make the church pure and the, the believers pure during that time. You know, Nero would burn alive Christians. He would use Christians as a source of light in the dark night when he was having his own pardons. He would burn alive Christians to provide light for him so he could drink and do wicked, immoral things. He had multiple wives that he killed in such vicious ways. I don't even want to speak about it. Vicious. He, and I'll just say this, and I'm not even going to get graphic, but he kicked and threw one of his wives until she died. He apparently regretted it. A few years later, this sadistic debauched man found a young boy who looked like his wife. He dressed him up like a woman, like his wife. He married her in front of the kingdom. This is the king, Nero. He ended up committing suicide. This kind of moral depravity always brings awful guilt and self-destruction. But you know, God is God. So let's press on confidently. Whatever's going on out there, know that our God rules and his word is true. And we need to be confident. Thirdly, though, notice what this says here. He says we can be confident in spite of wickedness abounding. We'd like for everyone to be saved. Wouldn't that be great? We want, we want that, but it's not going to happen. Here he says, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Wow. So we need to be confident in spite of wickedness abounding. God, in the time of great tribulation, God rains down these different persecutions upon the world and, and tribulations. And still the wicked did more wickedly. Many of the wicked refused to repent. It says in the book of Revelation, they repented not of their murders and their sorceries and their, their drunkenness. Now look at that verse 10. And I want to ask you a question. You have to answer the question the way I want you to. <laughs> no, I really would like for you to answer that. What do you think the answer based on the Bible is? Where it says the wicked shall do wickedly. Hmm. My question is, what keeps the wicked from repenting? Pride. Okay. They enjoy it. Yeah. The wicked shall do wickedly. You know what, how I answered it? What keeps the wicked from repenting? Their own wickedness. They love their sin. They love, men love darkness, Jesus said, rather than light. How about this question? What keeps the wicked from understanding? It says, none of the wicked shall understand. How come? What, what keeps them from understanding? Their own what? Their own wickedness. Their wickedness keeps them from repenting and keeps them from understanding. Men love sin, and it is their love of sin that keeps them in darkness and groping in the dark without light. This city and this world without Jesus Christ is staggering around like a drunken man in the way. They need Jesus. And don't be discouraged when the wicked continue to do wickedly. It doesn't mean God is not in, in control. He is. His plan is going to work out. Look at the book of Revelation, the last chapter, the end of the story. Look what it says even in the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 11. It says, Revelation 22, 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Those are some tough words. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. I don't believe God is saying that if you're unjust, live in sin, because I don't want to, that's not, God isn't saying, I don't want to save you. That's not the point. The point is the unjust 
It's not going to affect in one iota the plan and purpose of, of Jesus Christ to come and establish his kingdom. You're not going to change or thwart God by your unjust life, your, your wickedness, your filthiness. Rather, he says, behold, I come quickly three or four times, three times in this passage of scripture, get ready. And the invitation is given to everyone in verse 17. And whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Repent of your sin and come to Jesus, whoever you are. But I'm saying this to Christians. Do not let the sin of this world discourage you or make you feel defeated because sometimes it is discouraging. But we are on the winning side. Amen. So press on confidently. The last thing I want to say about this first point is this verse really intrigued me. Psalm 18, verse 26. Can you read it with me? It says, with the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself forward. In other words, the same circumstance that the, that the saved goes through, they will say, wow, God is good. And the wicked will go through that same circumstance and they'll say, if there was such a thing as God, he would never let that happen, right? So with the pure, God works and we see his holiness and his love and his peace and his power through it all, even when trials come. But with the froward, they say that God is harsh. The idea of froward is stern, hard to please, harsh. Spurgeon says it this way, that God acts at cross purposes with the wicked. Now, the wicked say, if I were God, and if I had all power, and if I love people, I wouldn't let those things happen, right? We've heard that. That's the argument of the atheist. So the, the ones who are froward just see that God is froward. And that's the point of the text. The wicked shall do wickedly. Let it not Destroy your confidence in the Lord. Secondly, the Lord Jesus tells Daniel, wait happily. So now we're in verse number 11 and 12. And the main point where I'm saying wait happily, I'm getting right from verse 12, where Jesus tells Daniel, so how are you supposed to navigate life? How are you supposed to go your way? Go your way confidently. And go your way, waiting happily. Verse 12, blessed is he that waiteth. Blessed. That's the word happiness in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed. That's the word happy Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are those who are what? Persecuted for righteousness sake. Be happy. Wait happily. You know, when you look forward to something great that's coming, like your birthday, like when you were a kid, Christmas, you, you look, you, you anticipate life. You're happy waiting. I know some of you, when you were preparing your, for your marriage, you're still happily married, right? Amen? Amen. But when you were preparing for it, it gave you a lot of joy and happiness. Waiting for that day. We all are going to have a greater day when Jesus comes back. The blessed hope that's happy of all people. We should be a happy people. Amen. Don't let this world take away your happiness. Rejoice in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. It's our strength. Wait happily. You know, something about getting baptized gives joy, right? Look at that up there, Wanda. Yeah. I tell you, those were appropriate shirts. I just don't know why you didn't get all of us one, but that's all right. I forgive you. <coughs> Thank you, brother. Yeah. You know, some of the best pictures that I take are when people get baptized. There's some kind of this overflowing, sincere joy. When people take that step of baptism. So wait happily for the Lord. Wait ye upon me, Zephaniah chapter 3. Wait for it. It will surely come, Habakkuk chapter 2. 
Oh God, there is no God that hath prepared for them the, the heavens themselves as we wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. My soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Wait happily on the Lord. <clears throat> so let's just get into the text a little bit here. And I want us to just note the two time increments. They total an additional, follow me now, 75 days, an additional 75 days to the three and a half years of tribulation. And they're referenced in verse 11 and verse 12. So what am I saying? I'm saying that, and I'll just stay here and I'll play with the cursor. Remember the, the tribulation time. It's three and a half years is the beginning of sorrows. And then three and a half years of great tribulation. This three and a half years of great tribulation is referenced in the Bible as 42 months, 1,260 days, or time, times, and half a time. Are you with me? Three and a half years. 1,260 days is three and a half years with 30-day months. But now in verse 11 and 12, what I'm saying is there's 75 days added to that 1,260 days. So let's look at it. He says in verse 11, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. You see, there's an additional 30 days. So, of course, we all want to know what are those 30 days. Okay, so 1,260 days is the three and a half years. In the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist will break his peace treaty with Israel. He will go into the temple. He will declare that he is God. He will do that abomination of desolation that he mentions once again for the last time in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. Jesus himself re referenced this in his Olivet Sermon, Matthew chapter 24. And then he says there will be 1,290 days. So he adds those 30 days. So the 30 days could well be a time of the cleansing of the temple. It could be a time of the judging of the nations. Matthew chapter 25, remember, when Jesus comes back, he's going to judge all the nations. And he's going to set the sheep and the goats. And he's going to judge the nations. Could be that. And it could be the resurrection of the tribulation saints in Revelation chapter 20. Because the tribulation saints will be resurrected and judged to enter into the kingdom. As well as Old Testament Saints will be resurrected when Jesus Christ comes back. Okay, so are you with me? So at the end of this three and a half years, there's an extra 30 days, maybe to cleanse the temple, to judge the nations, as well as the resurrection and judgment of the tribulation and Old Testament saints. Then we see the next verse, not only is there an additional 30 days, but then we see, secondly, an additional 45 days in verse 12. He says, blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty uh, five and thirty days, 1,335 days. So that's an additional 45 days added, 75 days total. So some believe this could just be the transition preparation for the kingdom of Christ. So in other words, remember... When we have our elections on November 3rd, a presidential election, somebody has voted in, then there's a transition to the new administration, right? And then the president is inaugurated January 20th, I think. So between November and January, it's a transition from one administration to the next administration. So this 45 days could be a transition to the kingdom from the kingdom of the Antichrist to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I believe he's going to be establishing his, his government. And he is going to be giving responsibility. And he's going to say, uh, Pastor Carmine, come. And I will give you your responsibilities. You will be in Williamsburg. You will be the vice regent in, in Williamsburg on Graham Avenue. And here's a rod of iron, all right? You know? So, but he, we're going to rule with Jesus during the kingdom time. I don't know exactly know what our responsibilities will be, but borders will be established. Appointments will be made. Inheritances will be granted 
And he says, you'll be happy as we wait. Wait for that day. I wonder what we're going to do for Jesus in that kingdom. Amen? He says we're going to rule with him. It's going to be awesome. The third thing, and lastly, as we get to the last verse of the book of Daniel, is continue hopefully. Continue hopefully. Wait happily. Press on confidently. Continue with hope. Look what he says in Daniel verse the last verse, can you read it with me? The last verse of the book of Daniel, he says, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. So when he tells Daniel that he's going to rest, what is he telling Daniel? He's an old man. What is he going to do? He's going to die. When he says thou shalt rest, he's talking about his body is going to sleep. His body's going to rest. His soul will go to be with the Lord. But as it says in Revelation 14, 13, can you read that verse with me? Up on the screen, it says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. So we say continue hopefully because you're going to finish your work. You know, isn't that an amazing, wonderful thing? Daniel's going to die, and he says, you have hope. Don't be afraid. He says, but go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest. There's such hope. There's hopefulness to that. You're going to die. But this is a good thing, because you're going to be in my presence. You will rest. But then he says quickly, you'll stand. In other words, when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to be raised up again. As Daniel had just written back in Daniel chapter 12, if you look with me there in verse 2, one of the clear statements of the resurrection of the body in the Old Testament, when he says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So he says, you shall rest, but you shall stand. You will rise. Amen. That's why we're not afraid of death. You know why we don't have to fear death? Because when we know Jesus, when our spirit leaves our body, our spirit goes to be where? With Jesus Christ. You have to know Jesus. He says, blessed are the dead which die how? Which die how? In the Lord. Are you in the Lord? That is, have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you believed that he died on the cross for your sins and was buried and rose again? And when you believe in him, you are placed in him, in his body. You are in Jesus Christ. You are in the Lord, and you can rest now. And when you die, your body will rest here on earth. Your spirit will go to be with the Lord. Your works will follow you. And then when Jesus comes back, you will rise up out of the grave. And then he says this, you will stand in thy lot. You know what the, a lot is? It's an inheritance. You'll stand in your inheritance. Like when now, when you buy a, a property in, in New York City, maybe elsewhere, but I just know New York City, everybody gets a block and what? A lot number. You familiar with that? You get a block and lot number. A lot is your inheritance, what you bought. So Jesus Christ is going to give us a block and lot. <laughs> and so he's saying, you're going to inherit that. You will stand in your inheritance at the end of days. So read verse 12 as we close here. He says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So I say continue hopefully, dear friends. Praise God, those who were baptized yesterday, you're following Jesus. Press on confidently. Wait happily, continue hopefully. The last verse I want to share with you, the book of Hebrews, which the men are studying on Tuesday night, and my wife is studying it with the ladies. Isn't Hebrews like chocked full of just awesome verses? What's your favorite book in the book? What's your favorite verse in the book of Hebrews? It's like really hard to say, you know, because there's so many great verses in the book of Hebrews. But this verse, I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but right now it's really toward the top of the list. Can you say it with me? Hebrews 6, 19, it says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, 
both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. The hope we have in Jesus is what? What does he say? It's an anchor for what? Our soul. And when I was a kid, we used to go out fishing with my grandfather on the Great South Bay. And I used to love it because, you know, I had a brother or sisters and we'd sometimes go out with the cousins. But when it was my turn to throw the anchor overboard, you know, and we would throw the anchor because we were going to fish in that particular spot. Throw the anchor down, Matt, Matt, and they would let me throw the anchor down or maybe pull it up. But this says we're anchored not in the sea, but where? In the heavens. Not, we're not anchored to the earth. We're anchored, and our, our anchor goes where? Where does it say? Our anchor enters into the veil. You know what was in the veil? The, in the heavenly sanctuary? The Ark of the Covenant, which is like the throne room of God in heaven, where Jesus is. So we are anchored in Jesus Christ. We're anchored in the sun. We're anchored into heaven itself. Hallelujah. So be confident. Be happy and be hopeful because Jesus Christ is coming again. And may all who hear the sound of my voice be a part of that great host of the redeemed who will rest in the Lord and rise and shine, as he says, shine, that you will one day shine like the brightness of the stars forever and ever. Let's stand together as we pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Daniel. Lord, help us to so live with these last days upon us. God, strengthen us today. Strengthen us for the pathway ahead. Strengthen those in school studying for their future work that they're anticipating and give guidance to our students to know what fields of labor to enter. Help those of us who have been doing the work you've called us to do, not to be discouraged, not to be defeated or depressed about what's going on, but to press on confidently. We know your plans are being fulfilled and we're waiting for you happily. And we're going to continue joy, hopefully, Lord, with our with the, uh, the anchor of our soul anchored in Jesus Christ himself. So we thank you, Lord. With heads bowed and eyes closed, even on Zoom, is there anyone who'd say, Pastor Matt, I'm not sure I'm saved. Please pray for me. Is there anyone here who'd say, Pastor Matt, I'm not sure that if I were to die today, that I'd go to heaven, but I must know, I want to know how I could be sure of going to heaven. Is there anyone like that? Just slip your hand up. We'll pray. If there's anyone on Zoom who needs Jesus Christ as your Savior, please contact us. Get in touch with Pastor Carmine, with Micah, myself, one of our deacons. Let us know. You can privately message us in the chat or text us. Let us know. We can talk to you and pray with you because the most important decision you'll ever make in this life is to put full faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you. Because Jesus himself said, you must be born again. And that's not through religion. That's not through church. It's not through works. It's by faith in Jesus Christ and the work of the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection that he did for you. Trust Jesus. Father, thank you now for this day, Lord. Continue to bless us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.